started. So hello and welcome everyone. This is Chris. He is a product consultant from SPSC. He's currently zooming in from Nigeria and bringing to us some great helpful information about a heuristics evaluation, what it is, how we can do it. And I won't talk about it anymore because I want to give him the floor. So without further ado, Chris, take it away. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Adolfo's Chris, yeah, from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I'm a senior product consultant uh, with uh, SBSC. Uh, yeah, it's so it's so nice to be here with everybody, and uh, I, I'm really, really looking forward to sharing all I have with, with, with us today. Um, so I think this is the point where I uh, share my screen, and let me just get right to it. Yeah, uh, I believe we can um, all see my screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, for today's um, workshop, we'll, we'll, be, you know, we'll be discussing about uh, you know, conducting heuristics evaluation. We're talking about uh, heuristics evaluation. So this session, is, this um, workshop is going to be uh, you know, quick. It's going to be broken down uh, into um, basically two parts. So the first part, I will be explaining the processes of conducting heuristics evaluation, the various heuristics that we have, and then the remaining 15 minutes will be used for you know, answering questions and you know, whatever suggestions anyone else wants to drop you know, during the course of this meeting, yeah, we'll have that. Yeah, so yeah, let's start, okay, <laughs> exciting. Yeah, so um, so we we'll just like, you know, give a uh, above background what heuristics mean. Uh, so heuristics just has to do with, uh, you know, the rule of thumb, a rule of thumb in the sense that it's a uh, you know a a widely accepted you know um um should I, a widely accepted you know motion. So let's say um in terms of you know design, in terms of um, UX design or UI design, a rule of thumb has to be you know uh, a a particular trend that is you know commonly that is generally accepted within the design industry. So um, that's what heuristics is. So heuristics is just you know, a rule of thumb that's broadly accepted, a broadly accepted approach towards solving the problem. Yeah, nothing is set in stone. That's, that's what I was trying to say. So it means we can still find our way around it and try to you know, you know, break the rules. You know, the rules that they are meant to be broken. You know? When we understand the rules, we understand how to break them. So that's just what a heuristics, heuristics means. Now, uh, so what is a heuristics evaluation? Heuristics evaluation itself is just, uh, it's just um, you know, the process where experts, you know, experts in usability, you know, test your product against different heuristics. So let's say uh, I have a product and I want to test for, you know, I want to evaluate you know, the, the usability heuristics of my, of my product. So I, I'll conduct a heuristics evaluation where I call in you know, evaluators. These are experts in, in usability and they come in and they you know, test my product against different heuristics that, that, that has been set already. So usability heuristics, you know, usability experts, you know, they audit and review, you know, searching for usability problems using known usability heuristics. So this, this usability heuristics is conducted by experts. Yeah, experts because uh, they, are, you know, they are well known and they've been grounded in you know, usability, but this can be conducted by anybody. And if you're running your hacker team, and if you're running your solution, you're building your project, this usability heuristics can be conducted by everybody or you know, the UX designer on your team easily. I'm going to show you how it's done and you know how to measure it. Yeah, so at the end of this session also, I'll be sharing uh, a, 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 a style sheet, a Google sheet with those, where I, you know, we have um, different heuristics and you know, how we're going to be testing against, um, you know, the heuristics we're going to be testing against uh, you know, when you're building your projects and, and um, you know, other heuristics like that that will have them. Yeah. So um, something else to note about, about heuristics is that uh, heuristics evaluation does not substitute for usability testing. Now, one of the key differences between heuristics evaluation and usability testing is that heuristics evaluation has to do with bringing on board you know, evaluators. You, know, you can have um, two evaluators, you can have four evaluators, you can have one evaluator. And this person, this, this is an expert in usability testing a product or a product designer testing the product out. You know, against non against non usability heuristics, whereas usability testing has to do with when actual users, that's people who are actually using your product, 
are testing out your product. So um, heuristics evaluation should not substitute for usability testing. You should have your heuristics evaluation and you still you should still have your you know, usability testing because usability testing is when you get you know, feedback from actual users and not just people who are well-grounded in the field of UX. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I've done justice to that. So yeah, don't substitute uh, you know, usability testing with usability heuristics, with heuristics evaluation. Both of them should you know, work you know, together and should be conducted, but don't substitute uh, you know, usability testing for, for heuristics evaluation. Now, uh, so uh, we have uh, you know, a very, very globally accepted, we have globally accepted heuristics in, in UX design. So we have the one from you know, Jacob, Jacob and Nelson, and we have the one from Susan. Now, if, if we go online and check the internet, we we'll, we'll discover that one of the most, that we we'll discover that in the, the heuristics, um, you know, the heuristics evaluation and heuristics that we we'll have uh, for, that was introduced by Jacob is widely accepted in the field of UX more than every other you know, usability heuristics that we we'll have out there. And uh, so for, for today, I will be focusing more on you know, Jacob Nelson's usability heuristics. Yeah, let's focus on Jacob's usability heuristics for today. Yeah, so um, a brief history. So um, initially, um, we Jacob uh, Jacob actually worked on you know, this usability heuristics with his colleague then um, who was on Rolf. You know, um, Rolf, both of them were you know, this um, you know, senior usability consultant then, and they, you know, they, they, they introduced um, together they introduced this you know, accepted usability heuristics that, that, was, that we had then, that was in 1990. Then, you know, four years later, Jacob went ahead to refine this, you know, known usability with over 200 usability problems that he has encountered because, you know, he was uh, you know, a, a usability consultant and an expert. So he constantly had, you know, had issues and, you know, was, and, and problems around usability was constantly brought to him and he had to do, and he had to, you know, Deal with those problems. So he sat down and in 1994 he refined these heuristics, and which is what is widely accepted. We find it and we have you know, the 10 usability heuristics that is widely accepted, which was you know, created by, which was introduced by uh, Jacob in, in 1994. Now, these usability heuristics are at a number and they are globally accepted. They are, they are, you know, they are global rule of thumb in terms of, you know, Usability you know, in the field of UX design, in the field of you know, field of um, product design. So, um, the first one we're talking about today is visibility of system status. Now, visibility of system status. What does this mean? Visibility of system status has to do with, you know, keeping your users informed. Um, don't keep your users in the loop. Uh, so, since this is a practical session, so I'm just going to take, uh, you know, one minute. I have a screen here. So, visibility of system status. So, I'm going to. Uh, Play like this, and we are going to just you know have a test and just and just see for ourselves. So, this is um, a screen, a login screen. So, if I click on sign in, I clicked on sign in, but I there is no response. Nothing is happening. I have zero ideas what is happening on my screen. I'm getting frustrated at this point because I don't know if my network is having issues or if. You know, the button wasn't clicked properly, or if you know something happened, or if oh, I have my screen here. So I waited that long, and now I have my screen here. Okay, so um, so for this, I can easily fix this by just coming here and changing this to loading. Quite simple, but. So when I click on this, it's loading. I'm made aware instantly that, okay, this is what's happening that, you know, my action is, you know, under consideration and the screen is loading. So I should wait till it's fully loaded. That's what this bit of system status has to do with. This bit of system status just, just it means that uh, you should not keep your users in the loop. You should always inform them of what is going on at every given point, you know, during their, you know, during the course of the of their journey within your application, within your system. So if you are building an application today uh, and you are and you want to, you know, you know, create some interactions or you know you have your buttons and just like that, you should ensure that 
your users are aware of what is happening at a particular stage of the application. If they are clicking the button, tell them that okay, this button is loading. If they are if they if they, if they if they want an action and the the internet connection is not stable, inform them that okay your internet is not stable, so this is going to take longer. If you are if you know if you want to uh, if if they are if they are playing a game or performing a test, you should keep them informed and say okay you scored zero, you scored ten, you scored twenty over twenty, you had them you know forty over forty. Always keep them informed. If it's a bit of system status, keep them informed of what is going on within the system within the application. Now, the second one is a uh, system and real world match. What this means is um, we should always make sure that our digital design matches, you know, the normal, the physical, you know, the physical, um, you know, representation. So, uh, for instance, I have another screen here. Yeah, so I have this screen here. So this is not going. I'm just going to like present this. So I have my screen here. So I have my illustrations. And when you see this, you know, okay, this is, you know, this has to do with chemicals, this is chemistry. When you see this, you see the calculator, you feel like, okay, this is mathematics. When you see this, you feel like, okay, this, these are alphabets. So this has to be, you know, English. You see this, you feel like, oh, this is, you no, know, this is physics. You know? So what it means is that we should always ensure that, uh, you know, we are building, we are building for, we are building um, a digital solution, yeah? So we should always ensure that uh, what we are building and the, the, you know, the language you're making use of is relatable to the physical device. So if you're, if you're, if you're making use of uh, a finance app or a FinTech application, you have terms like wallets, because physically we go about with our wallets, we keep our money in our wallets. If we want to buy goods, you know, we bring out our money from our wallet and we pay for the goods. So that's why digitally, if you're making use of finance app, you encounter terms like wallets. You encounter terms like cards, because physically we have our debit cards, digitally we also have our debit cards. So that's what it's trying to illustrate. That's what, that's what um, you know, Jacob was trying to say, yeah, where is, where, where, is, where is talking about, you know, system and real world match. So the terms that we use physically should also match the terms that we use digitally to create, you know, this consistency. So our users are able to easily understand that, okay, this is what I understand this, this um, particular, you know, application, this particular process to be. If you, if you, if you go to, um, if you go to the store to, to buy something, if you go to the store to buy something, you, you, uh, you encounter, you know, what you, you see, um, you know, your cart. You can push your cart around. You know, you can put, you, know, you can put more goods in your basket. Now, if you're making use of uh, Amazon to shop, or if I make use of most of this, you know, OMP, online marketplaces, you know, applications or mobile apps to, to shop, you encounter words like order, your order request. You encounter words like uh, checkout. You encounter words like carts or baskets. So these are systems that are digital, but are, you know, matching, you know, their physical, you know, the physical, if the physical, um, you know, device that they, that they were coined from. Uh, uh, another example I'm going to be giving is, uh, uh, okay, this, okay, uh, yeah. So um, in terms of, um, you know, system, another example I'm going to be giving is, um, if you make use of a MacBook, or if you make use of um, a Windows, you know, a Windows or uh, uh, a laptop, you see um, terms like recycle bin, you see terms like your bin, you know, this is where you, 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 throw, you throw your debts, what you don't want to get, you just dump it into the bin, then you recycle it. So the same words have been used in the digital world to match you know, their physical devices. So it can create this sort of consistency when we're making use of this application. So, in, so we understand properly that, okay, this means this, and you know, this is uh, you know, a wallet. A wallet is you know, to store my money. So I have to keep my money in my wallet. Card is for making payments. So if for my virtual card, I can put my virtual card. I, I hope that that's uh, you know, explained enough. Uh, yeah, so um, user control and freedom. Now, user control has to do with giving your users the ability to, you know, make a mistake and jump out of the mistakes immediately. So, uh, if I make use of an application, so if I uh, make use of an application and um, I mistakenly click a delete button, I don't want, I don't want, uh, I don't want it to be deleted, you know, almost uh, immediately. I want to have. Sorry for the. Uh, yeah, feel free to train your questions. Yeah, uh, so you can easily, you know, oh, sorry, I've gone ahead. Yeah, using control and, and, and feedback. So I, I have an example here. 
So I'm just going to see what I have here. So I'm just going to play this. I'm going to close this. Sorry, I'm just trying to. So I'm going to play this. So we we'll just uh, just give us an example of what I'm trying to illustrate. So this is um my modules, yeah, and I want to you know talk about you know user control and freedom, giving the user the ability to you know escape from you know conscious or subconscious mistakes. So if I click on this mistakenly, it's deleted automatically. It's no longer there. So I had no intention of doing that. I simply wanted to click the play button, the start um the mod start model button, and it's gone. So why is it gone? There is no freedom which means I, I i don't have you know i don't have control over the system but now a simple fix can be to just take this here and uh, just place it here like this so if i come here and i restart this so if i click on this i'm, I'm prompted you remove the course um you try to remove mathematics from your list of courses you want to continue or you want to go back Oh, th this is a mistake. You know, I quickly exit this, and no, no, um, no harm is done to to uh, to to my uh, to 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 what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, so um, that's what it means when 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 Jacob was talking about user control and freedom. User control and freedom has to do with giving your users the ability to, you know, exit from mistakes, unpleasant scenarios. That's why if you're using um. Microsoft Word, if you're using uh, you know, Google Docs, you have terms like undo, you have the undo, you have the redo. So if you make if you make mistakes, you know, subconsciously or consciously, you can easily you know escape from such such um, you know, scenarios. Yeah, consistency and and standards. Now, this consistency and standards has to do with, you know, I don't want to use the word reinventing the wheel. I don't want to use the word reinventing the wheel, but by consistency and standards, it's trying to tell us that uh most of these applications that we're building, we have something similar in the market. We have some terms similar. So if I'm working on a finance application, I don't want to replace the word wallet with car. That's, that's not consistent, which means when people come into my platform, they have to learn how to navigate the system newly, whereas it's something that has already been in place. So consistency and standards just means uh, that People have built similar systems before. People have modeled similar systems before. So instead of us trying to create something utterly different that has to, you know, take the user, you know, extra time to start learning how to navigate our systems, we should, you know, try to employ these consistencies and standards that have been set, you know, by industry experts. So we make use of this, we make use of the same terms. If I'm working on a FinTech application or a finance application, I, can, I should reuse the term wallet as much as I like. I should use the term cards. I should, I should reuse these terms that are consistent across the finance industry. I shouldn't go ahead and try start trying to replace um, you know, cards with um, cushion or something else that does not relate to the particular industry I'm building for. Yeah, prevention of, of errors. So giving your users control over your system is great. But building a system that, that, that you know, allows them to not easily make mistakes is even better. So uh, most times when people are navigating uh, you know, a, 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 an application or a mobile app or, or you know, uh, an interface, they tend to make two types of mistakes, you know, conscious mistakes or unconscious mistakes. Conscious mistakes is just our users trying to test out different things. They want to test out the whole, they want to test out this, but they don't test out, okay, if I drag this, will this delete, will it not delete, will this, you know, go up, will it not go up? They want to experience, you know, your application. You know, you can't dictate how a user will, you can't dictate how 1 million people are going to make use of your application. So, try. So most of them we try out some we try out some things consciously, you know, to check out the system. Most of them make these errors subconsciously. So you should try to build a system that allows, that does not allow for you know your users to easily make mistake for people to easily make mistake when they are navigating your application when they are navigating your system try to uh, you know try to you know make use of you know terms and uh, you know try to make use of you know uh, um you know words and and clear uh, you know clear uh, 
clearly defined buttons, clearly defined UI element and components that allows you know that that um, you know allows the user to be well aware of what you are trying to do in order to help them prevent you know committing most of these errors. Yeah, so um, recognition is better than recall. Recognition is better than recall. Has to do with uh, we trying to uh, you know build uh, systems. You know having this you know uh, a balanced visual you know language. By you know, a balanced visual language, I, I'm talking about you know, if you are making use of uh, a button, make use of placeholders for your button. Now, if you have placeholders for your button, now, if you have labels for your button, when a user sees this, they recollect that, okay, this is a button, I have to click on this to be able to type. You know, when you're making use of your city, make it very, very distinguished and make it you know, consistent across board. So when a user, when a user you know, navigates to another part of the application and they encounter a button, they're aware that, okay, this is a button and I have to click on this button. So help them to you know build you know create a a a um, a, vet, a, um, a visual language that's consistent enough that enables the user to be able to identify elements on your interface easily without having to try to recall on seeing this element they should be able to identify that okay this is a placeholder this is a button okay this is a tag this is not clickable okay this is a this is a you know an input field I should I should definitely feel this. So um so that's what uh, that's what um Jacob was trying to talk about when he was you know talking about recognition is better than recall. So create a consistent visual language that you know helps users helps people navigating your interface to be able to identify you know elements on your interface. Yeah, flexibility and efficiency. Now this is one very very important part of um, you know usability the users should not be confined your your interface should not be should not be should not be should not be cagey if i should use the word you should enable them to be able to you know be flexible you know add accelerators so when you're building an application you want to build uh you know an application that accommodates both new and existing users you want new users to be able to come into the platform and perform tasks easily you want old users to be able to come into the app and perform tasks you know even faster because of their well aware of this application yeah so just recently i discovered that on my samsung phone i have swipe gestures i can swipe on my phone and i'll start playing music i don't have to start you know opening my music my music application on my phone i can just swipe and you know i start playing music that was like wow okay so someone making use of samsung for the first time might not be aware that they can easily swipe their phones to you know to start playing music or to like you know shake their phones and start playing music but i'm i've been using samsung for quite for quite some time so i'm aware that if i shake my phone i can you know easily start playing music from just shaking my phone so this is this this you know affords me the uh the, you know the ability to be able to perform tasks faster it's 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 very flexible for for me because i don't have to go through you know three clicks again i can just do this in just in just shaking my phone this is flexible enough. It's flexible enough for old users and it's flexible enough for you know new, new users. It should be efficient enough. By efficient, it means it should be able to uh, you know cut you know the time it takes for user to complete a particular journey. So let's say I want to uh, order for food on Uber Eats. Yeah, I want to order, I want to order for food on Uber Eats. So instead of me having to click, I can you know swipe my phone and then it takes me to the other page. For new users, they click and it's you know flexible for them, efficient for them. So as they keep learning and navigating within the system, they understand that okay, I can perform tasks you know even faster with you know different accelerators within the application. So when building application, add accelerators, you know, add them, you know, add gestures and you know other functionalities that makes it easier for people to you know perform tasks faster. That accommodates both the old and new you know users on your on your on your digital product. Yeah, minimal and pretty. Yeah, sorry. Minimal and pretty. Yeah, minimal and pretty has to do with, uh, you know, don't, once it's not necessary, take it off the screen. That's, that's my number one rule when designing a screen. If it's not contributing, if it's not needed for a particular user journey, for a particular, you know, task, for a particular task completion, I take it off the screen. That's minimal. So to reduce the cognitive load or on on the user on the person you know, navigating your system, you want them to be able to you know 
do what is needed at that point. You want them to be able to come into your platform, into your application and perform tasks without any disturbance. So minimal does not mean it should be less aesthetical. I believe aesthetics, uh, I, I tend to believe that aesthetics in itself is a function. So aesthetics and functionality works together. So by minimal, it does not mean it should be, you know, shabby or, or less pretty. You know, make it pretty and make it minimal. Minimal has to do with, you know, whatsoever is not needed, take it off the screen. If I don't need, if I don't need a button at that particular, you know, point of that journey, I should take off the button. It's not needed. That's minimalism. You know, what is needed at that point to complete a task, to complete a journey, is what should be made available to the user. Yeah, recognize, uh, diagnose, uh, uh, recover. So this is um, how this has to do with uh, error messages. So most of the time you are on the platform and you you log in, and then your your uh, email is spelled wrongly, and you know you get a prompt that says, okay, your email is is not correct. This email is not signed into this platform, and then you know, okay, this is my email. But I've made I've made use of um, applications, you know, web apps specifically, where I input my email address, input my password, and I just get an email that says either your email, either your uh, you know your password or this is wrong, or I get no error message at all, and I'm like, what's happening on this? Like, what's happening on this application? You know, I'm 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 frustrated because I know there's clearly an error, but it's not being communicated properly to me. So recognize, diagnose, and recall has to do with you know, using effective messages to pass information across to the user. If they're if their emails, if, if they are inputting their email wrongly, inform them that okay, um, your your email is you know, is not registered on the platform. Just help us check your email again. If the email is on the platform and the problem is coming from the from from the password, inform them that okay, the email is quite alright, but the password has you know, has um, a bit of issues. Just check your password and you know, try to improve your password again, or you can recover your password. So recognize that those and recover has to do with you know, you know proper um, error, proper and effective error messages at a particular point in time. And now for the last, which is the tenth of the heuristics, um, this is um help and documentation. So um, for designers and when building out our solutions. We want to ensure that our solutions are, are, are easy enough to navigate, easy enough to understand. Yeah, that's true. That's the number one aim of, uh, of a UX designer, you know, improve the experience of this application. You know, make people come into the application and feel at ease immediately. You know, your onboarding process should be seamless, your this should be, you know, should be good enough, but help and documentation also falls in place into, you know, this usability test. This um, usability heuristics. So for the help has to do with you know onboarding tutorials, you know, how to perform a task. Um, if you want to go from point A to point B, this is what you have to click. And this does this, uh, this takes you from point A to point B. This brings you back from point C to point, you know, to point B. So give them, you know, afford them the opportunity to, you know, to be able to, you know, learn how to navigate the, the platform, you know, make use of um, FAQ pages, you know, questions that have been answered over time to give them a feel and a view of how they can properly navigate uh, this, this your system, that, this system that you, you've created. Now, um, so steps to conducting usability heuristics. Yeah, yeah so we've talked about, um, you know, what heuristics is, we've talked about what usability heuristics is, we've talked about what usability heuristics is, um, is not, we've talked about, you know, um, Jacob Nelson and, you know, the history of, you know, how came about this usability heuristics that we make it up today. We've talked about the 10 heuristics, um, usability heuristics that we have by Jacob. And now I want to, you know, properly go into how to conduct this heuristics evaluation. So for conducting heuristics evaluation, um, for conducting a successful heuristics evaluation, the first step is to uh, define your scope. Yeah, so by definition of scope, I mean, um, what is your budget? So if, if, it's, if it's, in this um, case, a, a hackathon, so the first question is you know, your time constraints. How long do you have? Do you have one hour? Do you have two hours? Do you have three hours? Can you afford five hours to conduct this, uh, this um, heuristics, you know, this um, heuristics evaluation? So um, define 
your scope by scope i mean you know, your your constraints in terms of you know your time and your budget and you know define the particular heuristics you want to test for and you know the time and um what's it called um the uh the part of the application that you want to be testing are you are you evaluating your uh are you evaluating uh the the onboarding flow are you are you evaluating the authentication are you evaluating the you know, the other process are you evaluating the fund wallet process or you know which processes and which part of the application do you want to be evaluating so after that you recruit your usability experts but in this case if since it's uh you know a designer team in this case you know you want to you know speak among yourselves okay who is going to be conducting this is a bit heuristics this heuristics evaluation for us um who is going to be conducting for us? so you select who will be conducting this heuristics evaluation among you know from from your team members then decide which heuristics to follow so i've i've talked about um, jacobs and heurist and usability heuristics i've talked about uh, i didn't you know go deep into susan's you know, heuristics uh, evaluation uh so you decide which you want to make use of so if you're going with um, you know jacobs uh you no, know, these are the heuristics. They, you know, okay, these are the heuristics we are going for, and we want to test for the first six or the first three or or the first two. Now you conduct after you've set your scope and then you've you know you've chosen your evaluators. The next step, yeah, and you've chosen evaluators and you've chosen a particular heuristics to follow. The next step is to you know conduct this evaluation. Now, after I convert the evaluation, let's say um, you have uh, two UX designers on your team and both of them conducted this you know, heuristics um, evaluation. So they come together, they bring their results and they collate their results uh, you know, to find out, to get to the, you know, to, to, to be able to you know, bring out their final findings for, for this, uh, for the, for the um, evaluation that they've, that they've done. Now, um, setting a rating system. So uh, when conducting your six evaluation, you set your rating system. So uh, we have, um, you know, um, from zero to four, and then we have um, severity. You know, uh, um, zero has to do with you know this is not a usability problem, which is this is this 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 is this should be this is not a problem at all. Zero means this is not a problem at all. One just means you know it's cosmic, which means can be can be overlooked. You know, let's just keep this and go to more important you know, um, faults in our, in our usability, in our, you know, in, our, in our product. Then for two, two represents minor, which means this, this, is, this is a problem actually, but you know, this should not take all of our time. This should be given, you know, very, very little priority, you know, and we should, you know, afford more time to things that are even more critical. Then we have major. Major is um, important to fix, which means, you know, this should be fixed at this point. You know, this should be given, you know, higher priority compared to minor or, or cosmic. And then when the problem or the usability fault that you find is catastrophic, this means, you know what team, we're not sleeping, we're not going on break, we're not having lunch, we're not having dinner until we fix this particular usability problem. That's what's forcing me So once it's catastrophic, it means it needs to be fixed at that point in time. It's very, very critical and very, very necessary and very, very essential to, to be fixed at that, at that point in time. So um, how do you calculate the overall uh, evaluation score? So, most, so let's say at the end of the day, you, uh, you conducted um, you know, your heuristics evaluation and you evaluated for six you know, heuristics, you know, six usability heuristics. So how you do is um, you add the figure of, you, know, you add together uh, the figure of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the findings that you've gotten. So let's say I tested for feasibility of system status and I have to. I tested for uh, you know um, flexibility, you know, user control, and I, I I have a score of one. I tested for uh, for um, for error prevention, and I have one. So at the end of the day, I tested for three. I tested you know three usability heuristics. So I'm going to add together all the all the score for each of these three usability heuristics, and then divide them by the number of heuristics I tested for. So if I so if I have a score, if I tested for uh, you know, three usability heuristics, and then for my findings, I have you know first one I have two, second I have one, third one I have one. That's um four. So I'm dividing you know four by by three to get my overall evaluation score. To get my overall overall uh, evaluation score, 
And uh, yeah, that's how uh, you conduct your you know, heuristics evaluation. And uh, that's uh, you know all for for my presentation for now. So I'll be um, opening up the chat room for for questions um, regarding my presentation. I hope I did not you know breeze through that very 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 uh, quickly. I don't know. Okay. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been amazing. Um, I think it's been really insightful. There's so much great information. I think everyone's really, really excited to have all this great, great info. Um, and yes, we can start up our Q&A session of the event. Chris is here to answer all of your great questions about anything that he talked about, but anything beyond. Chris is a very experienced uh, UI UX designer, as you can clearly see. So he has everything that you need to know about going through the whole process of heuristics and other aspects of design. So feel free to throw some questions into the chat. Um, and I know that you're probably typing them out now, but I'll start it off. Um, my question for you, Chris, is what is your favorite tool to use when it comes to heuristics or any kind of set of doing this, this design process, anywhere from like ideation to the final product and prototyping and testing phases? What's your, what's your favorite tool to use in, in, in between that process? Um, so um, so if, I, if I should um, rephrase your question properly, you're asking um, what tool do I use um, you know, during my you know, UX process overall? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like from, either from either a virtual finish. tool or yeah, any at any point during your process, what's your what's your favorite tool to use? Uh, I think my favorite tool is Figma. <laughs> Clearly, uh, but if I if I should if I should list the tools I make use of, so uh, for for documentation and um, you know research plans, I make use of Google Docs. Uh, for for site mapping and um, you know uh, you know um, you know creating my feature tree and just like that, I make use of Miro. I also make use of, you know, uh, for um, for empathy maps and just like that. I make use of, uh, I have, um, I, I make use of whimsical. I make use of, um, you know, whimsical. I make use of, uh, of mirror for, uh, for testing when working with developers, you know, when I, for hand, for designing my, uh, my UI and, uh, you know, my, uh, for my, for, for designing on my UI, I make use of uh, Figma. For, for prototyping, I make use of Protopy for, uh, what was it called for um, for test for handing off to developers? I make use of Zeppelin uh, for testing during you know development stage. I make use of Markup IO. You know, I make use of Markup IO to give feedback based on you know the test during the test session. Um, this is not pixel perfect. Yeah, this is this text is not you know is not properly you know um you know uh tra translated or you know properly represented. So I I make use of um you know um. <laughs> Markup IO for for such. Then for you know for project management and the rest like that. I make use of I mean I've made use of um of um Jira, I've made use of Asana, I've made use of um, Clubhouse, I've made use of um Trello and the rest like that. So uh, those are uh, most of the tools I make use of during you know my my process and while working with with teams. Wow, that's a lot. That's great to hear. I think a lot of people will definitely benefit from knowing a bunch of those. I'll reiterate a couple of those. Uh, Chris mentioned Google Docs, Miro, Figma. I know a lot of people are familiar with Figma and Google Docs, but another couple that uh, he mentioned was Asana and also uh, Miro, as I just said, a bunch of different ways you can go about using those throughout your entire process. So great, thank you. I, uh, you've, you've quenched my curiosity on that. Um, we have a couple of other questions here. So Haley asks, uh, what inspiration slash style, actually, we'll go up a quick. Um, yeah, Haley asks, what inspirations slash styles do you draw from when you design interfaces? Uh, I, I am just, I, I am always, you know, searching for, you know, I you know inspirations on on the internet. I'm always you know going on Play Store and App Store to you know, check out applications. So, I think I I draw my inspiration from from everywhere. I I believe most of the times I draw my inspiration for you know for color palettes from from shirts, you know from people's clothing, because I feel like everything is designed. You know, design is around us. So I tend to draw my draw my inspiration from things around me. You know, I tend to draw my inspiration from anything I can I can lay my eyes on around me. I try to you know find meaning into everything that I say. I try to, you know, 
you know, I try to break down the, the, you know, the aesthetic and the functionality of everything I'm saying. So outside that also, I make use of Dribbble, I make use of Pinterest, I make use of Behance, and um, I make use of awards. I, I make use of, um, you know, uh, I make use of, um, uh, is it Moise? Yeah, I make use of Moise also. I make use of most of these platforms, like, you know, just check out interfaces and things like that, that I can, you know, try to draw out inspirations from and, you know, work from there. Yes, wow, great. Another great list of different resources you use, including Dribbble and all the other Pinterest and everything else. Um, it's it's really cool to think about the your inspirations. A great question from Haley about that. I think it's a really unique answer you gave. Uh, clothing is something that really not a lot of people would think of in terms of like an inspirational part, but it can definitely be a source of not only culture, but as you said, function and being able to see how people how people utilize it. Clothing is one of those things that it's actually the pinnacle of user experience. If if you think about it, it's it's the very definition. So thank you, great great insight there. Um, yeah, thank you. yeah. Uh, we have a, a question from Christine, and she says, "I'm studying behavior and health currently, and have zero experience in UI UX. You and many others, Christine." Um, and she says I, that she sees that you're working uh, at SBSC, and was wondering if her background could help in design in that industry, her background of behavior and health. Um, and also a quick question about what your most memorable project you've worked on and why it was the most memorable. Yeah, um, okay. So to answer the first question, I, I, I mean, uh, UX, uh, UI does, is, not, uh, does, is not really tied to um, you know, what we you know, studied in university. Like I, I, for one, I was studying physics physics so physics has nothing to do with ui ux but here i am today doing ui ux so uh, i i believe i believe uh, uh uh your background in you know behavior and health um does not really affect you um it does not really really uh um so um so i see you working at this business and was wondering if a background could help in design, in design in the industry. Yes, okay. I think I, I got I got I got the whole question wrong. Yes, your this, your background definitely gives you an edge. Gives you an edge uh, in terms of in terms of you know in terms of uh, you know coming into the field of UI UI UX because you you can easily work with you know health tech easily. You can you can become a very very you know, renowned UX you know. A renowned UX experts because of your you know your background in you know in behavior because I I I want to believe that behavior you know somehow is tied to you know psychology in a way and when you're talking about psychology and human behavior and just like that you, know, you are bringing in UX into you know into the fold how people you know interpret how people navigate how people you know tend to see and tend to understand things differently. So I think your background gives you an edge and you know puts you in a very, very strong position, you know, when coming into this uh UI UX field. Uh, so uh, what is my most memorable project you've worked on and why? So um starting out design, I wanted to you know solve problems for people. I wanted to build applications that uh, you know people I can point out to and say, okay, I built this and this helped so so and so person. So I think what stands out for me is um Avildo Africa. Avildo Africa is um, a crowdfunding platform for, for Africans. So prior to working on the project, you know, they've not been, nobody has, you know, as I mean, you know, um, started the campaign on the platform in terms of raising, but I think up to this point, after we worked on the project together, you know, the whole team together, after we, the whole team worked on the project together and it went live, they've been able to raise you know, millions of Naira in helping you know, people all around Africa and sitting back and seeing what I was a part of, it's, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, a moment of, you know, yes, this is why I'm here and I'm actually, you know, living on my dream. Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's my reply to the question. Yeah, great. It's great to hear about your own experiences, especially as you get into a lot of these students wondering about like their, like what they can do to get into, into UI UX. So that's really helpful to kind of hear. Um, I'll still open it up, still have plenty of time for, for more questions. If anyone else has any, throw them in the chat. I'll read them off. Um, I think personally, I have a question about 
um, kind of from the, the user, but also the client standpoint as you're working with other people. Um, is, there something, is there something or multiple things that you think that, um, or you run into the most where uh, your client doesn't think of in terms of like um, heuristics? Like, is there something that like, that they don't, they don't keep in mind as much when it comes to UI UX that you end up having to explain or something along those lines that kind of makes you think like, ah, yes, this is, this is um, something that the common, the common um, people that aren't as experienced in UI UX wouldn't necessarily think of. Are there any like, uh, either from your presentation or from beyond that, any specific ones that like are, are less common that people don't necessarily think about as much? Um, I, I don't get your question. Um, no completely so are you are you saying um you know um you know, situations where i've been we have been in a position where i had to you know convince uh other stakeholders about a design decision or is your question tied specifically to visibility to heuristics evaluation yeah more about the the evaluation part but also from like you can answer it in any way you want but the um kind of thinking about like how some some clients will um kind of just go go all in for for a certain app and you kind of have to step back and think about different things have there any have there been any moments where uh your client says like uh or you kind of have to tell your client like oh think about this and they're like oh right i didn't think of that um, any specific instances of that where um, it's a specific um, a specific type of de part of design, part of heuristics? If not, uh, you can go into in any direction that you want here with that. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm going to just answer this in a general in terms of dealing with clients. So I, th I think I think most of one of the issues I, I face most times is now part of the world here. We are always you know short on. You know, on deadlines, always having you know, these short deadlines where uh, the client wants to do so much in so little time. And you know, you have to you know carry out the whole UX processes. You have to carry out your research. So most of the times, we have to you know, I I go the extra mile of bringing you know of you know researching on my own, you know, working over time to get this data that I need, and you know, and you know, create my presentation to be able to convince the client that uh, we need to you know conduct user testing. It's it's very very needed. We need to, you know, prototype this solution. It's very, very good. Most times they are like, you know, just design this stuff and you know, just ship it out to the developers and let's get this, you know, live. You know, I understand the urgency in terms of getting live, but there are some things that needs to be put in place, you know, for, in order for the application to be very, very successful. So most of the time, what I do is um, I go the extra mile. I create presentations, you know, and I try to convince the clients on why such processes or that particular or why I'm, um, you know, that particular uh, UX process is very, very essential to the design that we're trying to, you know, to, to bring to life. So I try to convince them and, you know, set this meeting with them where we all come together and, you know, we converse and, uh, you know, we try to, you know, find the common ground. And at the end of the day, most of, more on more occasions, we actually, you know, have a common ground and, you know, we have to you know, go over these, these processes. And, you know, most times it's like, it's not going to work for them due to their deadlines. And, you know, we have to, you know, work within their deadlines. And most times to convince them, I convince them and we're able to, you know, carry out the entire UX process. And yeah, I think I think that's one. Having to convince them that I ha having to create, you know, presentation slides and, you know, and, you know um, scheduling present and scheduling time for presentation on why, you know, such a process is essential in the particular, you know, journey of the particular product journey. Right. Thank you. You went above and beyond with that answer. And that, that's great to think about the different common ground is especially the very important thing. I think a lot of people will appreciate and kind of keep that in mind as they start to deal with not only their clients, but their, their target audiences when it comes to their own personal design project. So thank you. That was great insight there. Um, still open to any more questions that we have. If not, we can we can end a little bit. Actually, Haley has a question here. How do you see the UI UX design field advancing in the future? So, kind of look at your crystal ball. What do you what do you kind of see um, looking forward? Um, so I, I think I think um, going forward, I I don't know how to properly place this, but I think. Uh, UX and UI design is going to be at the forefront of, of innovation. Because if, if we look back, we discover that companies and you, know, and, you know, organizations that are thriving today are product-centric, they are people-centric, they are design-focused. 
if you look at Google, if you look at Netflix, if you look at uh, if you look at um, Apple, these companies are a design centric, a design centric organizations, and they are thriving today. So I think in the future we are going to have you know a lot of opportunities for UIX design because UIX design is going to be at the forefront of innovation. So I used to tell people at the end of the day you are building for people. At the end of the day you want human beings to make use of your digital products. You are not building this product for, for yourself or to just keep on the Play Store and use them alone. You want people to make use of this platform. And um, for people to make use of this platform, you need UI UX designers to come on board and create experiences and design experiences that is tailored to you know, most of your, you know, your, user, your user demography. So I see uh, for the future, I think, UIX design is going to be one of the very, very hot fields in terms of job opportunities. That's very, very certain. Now, it's going to, the, the job opportunities in UIX is going to be very, very huge. And then UIX designers are going to be you know, at the forefront of innovation. So that's, that's how I see uh, UIX in the, in, the, you know, in the future, you know, at the forefront of innovation and huge job opportunities and huge markets for people. Yeah. Great, yeah. That's, that's more than I could have said about the future of UI UX, but I think it was very well spoken, very well said. The, the whole, there's only so much we can see into the future, but you're right. I think UI UX is definitely gonna be at the forefront of innovation, the forefront of everything that we're seeing moving forward. Um, I think, uh, if we don't have any more questions left, um, still have plenty of uh, a little bit of time left for any last questions. But if not, I think that we're good for today. We have that all rolled out almost uh, almost an hour in. And yes, okay. So sorry, I was just kind of talking to. to <laughs> any more questions but it looks like we're everyone's you you spoke so well you can you spoke through the whole presentation gave great explanations of everything i think everyone took away a lot from that um and yeah thank you so much for for being here today chris and thank you so much for speaking to all of us about heuristics and the ui ux process this has been great yeah uh thank you thank you so much yeah so glad to be here yes so great and thank you everyone for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of the Catalyst 2021 event. Good luck on the rest of your projects here if you're working on a project. Um, and yes, have a great rest of your day. Feel free to go to any of the rest of the workshops, but we're gonna close off for today. Yeah.